Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in on behalf of Books and Books and Miami Book Fair. We thank you so much for joining this event, and we apologize greatly for the inconvenience of starting behind time. And um, we are just going to get right into it to um, continue and promote this wonderful book. And don't forget that you can buy this book on Books and Books' website. And without further ado, I'm going to allow our guests onto the virtual stage. Hi, Alison. Morgan, hi. Lovely to see you. <laughs> you as well. Yeah, you made it. Um, are you Skyping or Skyping? Are you videoing from home? I am. Yes, I am. I'm in. I'm um, at my place uh, in in Brighton, England. Yeah. I have to I share live. with our viewers if it's all right that you live in a church in the on the countryside, <laughs> which is, just sounds so I ideal. On the coast, sort of in Brighton, but on the coast. I'll see if I can flip. Um, the wind is around for a moment. That's, so that's let's see. Uh, that's my that's my oh, chair. Wow. So, so beautiful. It's a great space for writing. So I'm really I'm really lucky to have lots of light and space. Yeah, and I look oh. out in the morning. I can look out to the English Channel, which is full of colours. You know, it, I always thought it was, water was just blue, but it's not. <laughs> There's lots of different ones. I'm yeah. Sure. Wow, wonderful. Well, thanks so much for having me in conversation with you. I'm so excited to talk to you about tenderness. Um, Thank you for being here. I was lucky enough to work on the book uh, as a member of your publishing team at Bloomsbury in the US and on the UK side, uh, you work with our colleagues there as well. So it was a very fun process of seeing it land in the hands of readers in the US and the UK. Um, so I suppose maybe we can start by talking a little bit about tenderness. Um, in your author's note, you call the book a dialogue with D.H. Lawrence's famous novel, Lady Chatterley's Lover. So for those of our viewers who haven't read it yet, uh, will you give us a little bit about what the story is? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Lady Chatterley's Lover is D.H. Lawrence's 1928 novel uh, that was published privately because it was considered a scandalous you know, taboo novel primarily because it's a story of an illicit love affair an extramarital love affair between lady constance chatterley so the eponymous lady chatterley of the title and uh, her husband's servant the gamekeeper oliver mellers uh, the story begins in a, a, a grand house in the Midlands of England called Ragby Hall in 1922. And we learn that Lady Constance was married to her husband, the Baronet Sir Clifford, in 1918, so during the First World War. Uh, so 1917, then 1918, he was injured, a war hero. And essentially, the, the number of the story is that he was paralyzed um, in the war from injuries from the waist down. So he, he really represented many, many men who are coming back from the front, damaged, maimed, mutilated, uh, if they came back at all. Um, and their life begins in the wake of that, of that trauma of the First World War. So the story actually begins, ours is a tragic age, so we refuse to take it tragically the cataclysm has happened. So that's how the novel begins. But in the very first paragraph, Lawrence also goes on to say, no matter how many skies have fallen, we must learn to live. And the novel is about how we learn to live in the wake of ruptures in society um, and, and breakages and cataclysms. And how do we restore? How do we come back to ourselves? How do we find green shoots of life again, both individually and as societies, in the wake of, of major upheavals. Mm -hmm. So it's, this, it's a love affair, but it's a, it was considered um, a scandalous novel because Lawrence was unusually daring in the way he represented human relations, mm -hmm. the way he 
represented uh, uh, bodies together. He's very um, daring about his representations of, of human sexuality on the page. Um, for him, the whole aim was to remove human sexuality from taboo strictures to kind of be honest about what it was like to be in love and what it was like to have human desire. Um, but of course, in 1928, his publisher could not publish it. Um, and he therefore went on to publish it privately. And the rest became uh, the sort of history of the 20th century in many ways. And that it ushered in um, many years, well, 30 years later, two great upheavals, one in 1959 in New York when um, Grove Press in New York wanted to publish what would become this book. Um, so that's the Grove Press edition of the, the very first uncensored so unexpurgated Lady Chatterley's Lover. It looks quite so Wow, cool. and you have one that's I, so yeah, so nice. I'm sure. One down and it's um I love the way they published it almost to look like a kind of university textbook to make it yeah. look very sober and very probably like really over correction, right? They're yeah, like, this exactly. is a perfectly approachable book. Completely. <laughs> yeah this is this looks so respectable. And then um the next the following year there is the huge international show trial here in England and um, let me pull this up um, and this was the result this is the 1960 um, infamous paperback infamous because Penguin over here mm -hmm. wanted to publish this book as a cheap paperback as a paperback that anyone could afford at three and six so three and six was about the price of ten cigarettes which meant schoolboys could buy it um, servants could buy it housewives could buy it anyone could get their hands on this book and they did mm -hmm. that was one of the things that i was really excited to read about in tenderness as you talk about sir alan lane who is one of the founders of penguin press obviously one of the most internationally lauded publishers nowadays and he opened the press with the goal of sharing literature with the masses or mm -hmm. making it more accessible uh, for everyone to read. And that was part of what made Lady Chatterley's Lover so explosive and because at the trial they would say, would you want your wife and servants to read this? Would you want in yeah, this yeah, in the grave, it? Yeah, that was one yeah. of the classic lines from, from the child. You know, yeah. This is a book you would even wish your wife or your servants to read. And then everyone went, who has servants anymore? But it was yeah. the beginning of the kind of of the class system uh, beginning to collapse, and and the jury knew it. That, that so um, they didn't do themselves any favor with that line. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the whole question, right? That tenderness really spends time answering in a lot of different ways, um, and through a lot of different storylines is will this book corrupt will this book deprave like what will readers get from this and why should it exist yeah. and uh, i really love the way the book tries to think about what is the power of books and what happens when certain readers have them in their hands and have the ability to uh, make sense of their own sense of self and sense of how to live through a work of literature um, so there's a lot of famous characters, in fact, that get to comment on this. Um, I This is such a book lover's book because we have, you know, there's a couple paragraphs on Virginia Woolf. We have Lionel Trilling, the very famous book critic. E.M. Forrester makes an appearance, a few actually. Yeah. Uh, his sort of tete-a-tete -tete with D.H. Lawrence is really compelling throughout the book. Uh, but the most famous, of course, is Jackie Kennedy, who was a big fan. Um, and will you talk a little bit about like what the story of tenderness is and in and, and how she kind of comes into it? Yeah. Um, so if I kind of backtrack a little bit in, in terms of the research, I, um, I spent about four, four and a half, five years researching, um, and then, uh, and, and then began writing and still researching along the way. So it was, as I think you said, thousands of hours spent in archives with biographies and so on. And, and um, uh, the famous people who pass through it are passing through tenderness because they were passing through Lawrence's life on the whole and visiting and rubbing shoulders with and, and, and later some of those people 
reappear in actuality at the famous trial. But with Jackie Kennedy, I I was I, I needed, I suppose, a bridging figure. So I had Lawrence's world and the world, the creation of Lady Chatterley, the story of how that book came into being and what went into it. Essentially, let's say roughly from 1915 to 1930 when Lawrence died. So that's one period of the book. At the same time, in my research, I discovered, and I'm coming, going to come back to Jackie Kennedy from this, but I discovered that of all people, uh, um, J. Edgar Hoover was uh, the sort of director of the FBI at the time, was, was following the case of Grove Press and trying, um, as Grove Press was trying to bring out their sober tome that we were just looking at, the FBI were following and hounding that publisher, Barney Rossett of Grove Press. And I realized that, that, that this coincided um, everything building up around the trials coincided with the um, the climax, if you like, of the 1960 Nixon-Kennedy election, which was a very, very close thing. I'd forgotten how close a thing that election was. Kennedy won by just a whisker. So I became very interested that the FBI was trying to meddle with a novel in the middle of the Cold War. I thought, what on earth are they interested in a novel for in the middle of the Cold War? And I couldn't stop thinking about the fact that that one liberal cause, the novel, the freedom of freedom of expression, freedom of the imagination, was coinciding with another kind of great um, liberal pivotal moment in the 20th century, which was the election of Kennedy. And then in the midst of all that, I was thinking, right, I've got, I've got Lawrence here writing the book. We almost, I wanted to almost show the pen strokes of creation as you'd show the brush strokes if you were doing a painter. I've got Lawrence, I've got the FBI. What, who on earth might bridge those two disparate worlds? And I had a hunch that it just might be Jackie Kennedy, a young Jackie Kennedy around the age of 29, 30. She was just the age Lady Chatterley is at the time of that story's telling. So I thought, Jackie Kennedy, I thought, okay, don't go mad here, like, have a thing. Um, you know, you know she's, she's, you can't play fast and loose with a figure as iconic as Jackie Kennedy. But I just had a hunch because I knew that she used to, she was a reporter before she was married. I knew that she covered the coronation in England for the Washington Herald Tribune. Um, I knew that she was a huge book lover, a kind of ardent admirer of books, and that she had read Chekhov and Dostoevsky when she was young, that she painted, so she's a highly creative person. And then I discovered, I thought, that's it, I've, um, that she, in uh, 18 months after the London trial, she'd had a big conversation with Lionel Trilling, an hour and a half, locked head to head, talking about Lawrence's novels. So I thought, okay, um, she actually makes quite a credible bridging figure that she, I feel almost certain, I don't know, but I feel almost certain she would have been following the case of Grow Press and the Penguin trial. They were both in the news all the time, particularly the Penguin trial. So I don't have to think, um, you know, what, what, what liberties am I allowed to take? Mm -hmm. And I am a great believer that the imagination isn't something that just is, a, is only about escapism. It's not for me, it's something that takes the actual world and actual history and news stories. It takes us deeper, potentially, with the right amount of love and labor behind that work. It can take us deeper. And I began to think, how might Jackie Kennedy have read Lady Chatterley? And actually, I realized as I explored the lesser known portion of her life, which is before the, they ascended to the White House, that she was a relative unknown and that there were a lot of difficulties in their marriage at that time that are well documented, not um, as well known as her later life, but, but certainly documented. And I began tra tracking through. So my my... Um, approach was to think, right, can't play fast and loose. She's too iconic a character. But I had great admiration for her. The more I read about her early life, the more I just I came to admire the, the lesser known mm -hmm. Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy. Um, I suppose for her dedication to books and to the arts, um, which 
flowered and flourished in her later life, as we know. But there was the early beginnings of it. So I, what I do is quite, a, I, I follow the biography absolutely as closely as I can, various biographies, and looking for the small details. I open up the bits that are not quite knowable, but where I allow myself to imagine into the places where the private and the public meet. Um, and then I allowed myself, the one particular act of daring that I allowed myself was to imagine that she went into the hearing for Grove Press about that book on May 14th, 1959, that she was curious enough and anonymous enough to go in and take a back seat at that hearing. And from that, that decision, tend, a lot of tenderness opens up. Yeah, yeah. I hope, um, if you don't mind, I'd love to read one of your Jackie Kennedy sections, which I just love. Yeah. Um, which actually, for those who are watching, I have the beautiful book here. This is the oh, US edition. It's gorgeous. Obviously, this is backwards, but it's an absolutely gorgeous book with a really beautiful cover design. Um, and the UK edition is really beautiful as well very different um which is yeah really I've got, I, if i lift it i've got it propped up here it oh, really? oh, i'd love you to show it that's the yeah, so that's it's, very, sort of, it's a very different feel but both have this like very feminine and very mysterious but a lot of energy behind them and i just love that it's kind of tapping into both of those your i think the uk edition is a little more scandalous which i really appreciate but <laughs> We can't ignore the beauty of Jackie Kennedy on ours, but um, I love it, and I love the fact that on the American, there's the the original from the 1928 yeah. edition. Because it's the secret within her, it, and it is very much like that in tenderness. It's as if she's harboring a kind of secret. Yeah, and as it's like being peeled back and peeled like back, and then we've got the details of the original edition. It's such a beautiful object in its own yeah. right. It's really privately printed is what this yeah, is. Yeah, it's wonderful. I'm so excited when I saw that. Um, so this is a, a early in the book. We've just met Jackie and uh, JFK's father has just said that she can't conceive because she's made of porcelain. And this is um, what is written about Jackie. Her porcelain self had chips and cracks. She no longer recognized the woman who had formerly dispensed worthy advice and served as a winsome example to other young wives. Her sense of humor grew sharper, cleverer, and more wayward. She became at once less shy and more private. She minded loneliness less. She read endlessly while her husband traveled the country. She listened to fewer people in the Kennedy world. It was a calming thing, self-possession. She had to come to understand the spell of bodies, of presence, and with it, the power of silence, including her own. I just love that section because to me, it captures sort of the charisma of Jackie and her mystery and everything about her that we sort of are, are enchanted by, but don't know what's going on. I think she always kind of carried this allure that you couldn't figure out what she was thinking, but she had such a presence. It was never that when she wasn't speaking, you you felt like she was she didn't have a shy energy to her at all. Yeah. She had such um, a self-possession, didn't she? That's what I really admired the more I went back and looked at kind of early footage of her. And yet she, in her own terms, felt she was quite a shy person at this, that stage and was to the extent that her mother-in-law apparently feared that she wouldn't she wasn't cut out to be a politician's wife because she was too shy so yeah. uh, going back into that lesser known jackie I, I did find it um a real pleasure to do and to create a kind of homage to her the line about porcelain incidentally is, is apparently um again according to biographers something that that Joseph Kennedy did remark on about her. Yeah, wow, so let's talk about that a little bit because the whole book sort of orbits around this push and pull of fact and fiction. And you, you know, when I read it, I just celebrate the book as your imagination of what these people could have been, what their inner lives might have been like, what they might have wanted, what their dreams were, what their fears were as well. Um, but you can't sort of resist reading and wondering, did that really happen? And if that really happened, did this really happen? And it's a very fun experience of reading it because you're wondering, 
And obviously we know that you've spent so much time researching this history. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that liberty that you took and the, the uh, sort of relationship that that liberty had to the research that you had done? You call it literary detective work. Yeah. Yeah. Know, yeah. Um, I, I, I suppose, um, as I, uh, the main, as I said, the main risk I felt I took was moving Jackie's diary around. I don't even know that. I, in fact, I didn't let myself look to see what she, if it was recorded, what she was actually doing on May 14th, 1959. But the, for me, that was the, the major liberty I took. Otherwise, um, beyond that, I think it might surprise people to know how much and uh, is actually is actual is is kind of lesser known the minor timeline of the Kennedy marriage, and and this is where I began to realize oh my gosh and in my rooting around between all sorts of biographies lesser known and greater known, um, and spending time at the Kennedy Museum and, and knowing Cape Cod which I, as a place which I do well and that particular beach which I know very well um, where some some of tenderness is set. Um, my my aim always was was to work as closely as I could with with actual biography and to not mess with that as I because I have great respect for what's actually unfolded in anyone's life and so by and large for Lawrence for for many of the characters and from probably for them all actually um, I try to really be true because I think that's who the character was, and I'm I'm most interested in in working. I, I just think history is incredible. History is the news story of yesterday, mm -hmm. and so history and, and news are fantastical in their own right, and amazing and moving. I'm so moved by by so much of that timeline. But so, for example, in the Kennedy marriage, I hadn't realized that that um, there were a lot of rumors swirling about a divorce before the Democratic nomination, that they had gone through some major things. They, he'd had spinal surgery twice. She had had a miscarriage and had lost another child, uh, Arabella, a little bit later in the pregnancy. And she apparently had gone through a great grief around that. So um, she, uh, Kennedy himself, the great secret that was being hidden was that he wore a back brace because he had had a war, a war injury. So I'm beginning to think when I, as I think about, I was trying to imagine is how, given the timeline of Jackie Kennedy's life at that point, of course I'm imagining and I'm taking liberties even by doing it. But I do believe that whatever we, whatever we allow ourselves to imagine about real people, there's a way of approaching that in fiction. And, and, and we, if we want, if, if, if it's our inclination to imagine it, it's because we're curious and we have human questions. Therefore, it must be written or it must be writable. So um, I'm, I'm moving through the life and I'm thinking about the divorce, the divorce that was talked about, separation certainly was spoken of, according to biographers. And because the marriage had become quite unhappy, he was away so much of the time on the campaign trail. Um, they'd gone through some cataclysms with back surgery where he nearly died. She'd had this, particularly this late miscarriage that was very upsetting, obviously, for her. So it's not for me to say what the reality was, but as just a sympathetic person, I wanted to go in and imagine the private moments that were going on behind the official timelines. And I am in all my work, I think, fascinated and work with uh, those intersections where the public or the political even meets the private or the personal or the intimate even the intimate and increasingly i began to think gosh well it's i'm imagining clearly but if i were jackie kennedy reading uh lady chatterley's lover as i feel sure she must have at the time of the trial and perhaps before then she'd be reading about a wife who was very lonely I mean that that is ultimate the story. She was married. She was she was reading the story of a woman who was from a well-to-do family who seemed to have had it all, but in fact was very lonely and and quite isolated as well within her within that situation, that family situation. That she was married to a war hero, as Jackie Kennedy was. That there was a sort of um, a, 
uh, not quite a cover up in Lady Chatterley. It was obvious that her husband was in a wheelchair. But there are all the concerns about what it meant to be a wife and the guilt that would come from that, from um, no longer desiring her husband, not because he was in a wheelchair, but because he had become quite a sterile figure, quite a numbed figure after the war. And in Jackie's case, the distance perhaps became because, as is well documented, there were a lot of affairs and flings going on at that time. So the distance was there if from a different source. So um, it seemed to me, once I knew that Jackie Kennedy was a great admirer of Lawrence, I worked very closely with the biographies. And then um, it, it sort of broke down into the minutiae, if you like, the emotional minutiae and try to plait or braid those worlds, the political, the public, and the private, me imagining the private. Um, but thank thankfully, that's what the novel allows us to do. It allows us to connect with lives that might seem outwardly different from ours. And the, after the imagination, I think, is not diversions. Or if it's, if it's done well, I, I hope to goodness I've done it well. It's about going deeper. Yeah. Oh, it's breathtaking what you've done. And I think on the, the way of the political, you've managed to, you know, you take us back to 1915, right in the middle of World War One, which is when D.H. Lawrence's career has, it's sort of a midpoint, I would say. He's yeah. published a couple novels. He's about to write Lady Chatterley's Lover. Um, he's releasing a short story collection in the in Tenderness is where he's at. Um, and he feels that England is broken. It's really he has despair over the, the ruin, as you described his mm -hmm. opening lines in the book, uh, that the country faces. And then in the other parts of tenderness, we're taken to the 50s, as you mentioned earlier, in the Cold War, which is really a period defined by so much fear and anxiety about our susceptibility to uh, what's wrong in the world. And you sort of bring us into the homes of these periods to ask those questions in a way that it affects, you know, the big political events, the major timelines in history affect how we interact with our loved ones. They affect how we love. They affect uh, everything about our lives and how they're structured. And you're able to balance those sort of big, big, historical events and make them um, private, as you say, uh, in the ways that they would have been for those who were living through these mm -hmm. periods. I'm curious, what kinds of questions do you think that a reader today uh, can ask about our own period? I love that the opening lines are just so perfect coming out of, of 2020 and what we've all experienced. Um, you know, you, you mentioned it earlier, I have it pulled up. The capitalism has happened, yes. Yeah. It's a tragic age, but we refuse to take it tragically. Um, yeah. What kind of things do you think that readers reading into both of these time periods can sort of pull for our own day? So interesting. Such a good question, Morgan. Um, well, it seems to me, if I think back to the, the first of those two periods, the sort of the, the First World War, the Great War, as it's sometimes called in England especially, um, and I think, if I think particularly about D.H. Lawrence in that period, um, and what D.H. Lawrence was wanting to do with his novel Lady Chatterley. So he was wanting to write something much bigger than a love story. He, he ran pretty deep, Lawrence. So nothing is just what it appears on the surface. It is a very beautiful love story that was originally, um, a, a working title, as you'll know, was originally Tenderness, which is where the, the title of my novel is borrowed from. But Lawrence was also, um, attempting, and this is his last novel of life. He's, he's, he's dying as he's writing this novel. He's pouring all of his energy into it. And for him, it's a sort of love letter to his own country or to any country that's been broken by something major, as major an upheaval uh, as, as the First World War. And he's, um, he's trying to say, where does renewal come from? Where does restoration come from? Um, how do we heal ourselves? And part of his answer is a very radical notion of tenderness. For Lawrence, it's not a sense, and I think this is part of it for us today, uh, coming through pandem a pandemic, where we've all been shaken by it um, in different ways and in many shared ways. But for Lawrence, tenderness and human connection, honest, compassionate human connection, 
um, between the sexes, but more widely than that, a kind of uh, between classes, between Lawrence's term, between the classes, between different groups within society, those with whom we might interact, but we think of as other than us. For him, tenderness was the great bond and the great bridge, but it wasn't sentimental. It wasn't a, a, a kind of only a warm, cozy feeling. It was about acknowledging and um, confronting honest truths about human experience, the negative sides, the darker sides, the frightened sides, the vulnerable sides. And Lawrence in Lady Chatterley really pushes those out in such a bold way in exposing our human vulnerabilities and fallibilities and our dark impulses. And, and Lady Chatterley and the gamekeeper, Oliver Mellor, is going to push through that. So tenderness is a kind of coming through. It's, it's an act of coming through something. And I think for Lawrence, that was really important as it is kind of something a message he sends forward into the future. Lady Chatterley, I think for for the novel, for the United Kingdom, and I think more broadly, is um, a sort of native English goddess figure. She's a sort of healing figure. And um, that's about the green shoots of spring coming through. The, for the war, that time, the war, I think there's something else. With the green shoots, I think there's something about, that for Lawrence, that's hugely important about the environment, about the natural world. And I think that's something that resonates for many of us today, about retaining, sustaining, and, and breathing life into our connection. The more and more divorced we, he began to see that. The First World War was industrial scale slaughter for him. And that's where he saw the first breakdown between, uh, where he, he felt men became machines rather than men connected to the natural universe. So Chatterley is, a, is a, a hymn to the natural world as well. And Lady Chatterley is its native goddess. For the, the Cold War period, I think, for me, as I was writing, I'm never interested in writing a historical novel unless it connects to contemporary preoccupations and contemporary concerns. Mm -hmm. for, me, for other writers, I'm sure there are reasons for doing it. For me, I'm only interested in going back historically if I can time in, like really sort of um, drive a fuse back to the now, back to where we are. And for me, that Cold War period, and particularly the work of the FBI, which is what, what I wanted to show a spotlight on, um, was, was resonating for me in a frightening way with um, issues that we have today still very much around, first of all, censorship, obviously. Um, many of your, uh, or our uh, viewers today will have heard about the case of Beloved in Virginia, which raised great concerns for me. And Toni Morrison's books are often near the top of the banned list. So, but the, Banning and censorship is still a kind of thin edge of, of the wedge. And if we start banning books, then we're banning um, freedom of speech, obviously. We're banning, we're saying that it's only certain kinds of imagined, of our, uh, certain kinds of imagination are allowed, that only certain sorts of inner life experience are permissible or acceptable. And from there, we can, it's just a kind of hop, skip, and a jump to surveillance, to surveillance society, where some um, human activities are deemed fine, um, some are deemed that uh, for, for the FBI, it was all about un American activity um, and normalizing and conforming and saying this is wholesome American activity, this is not. And as a result, presses like Grove Press, you know, and this book, this publisher, were constantly being hounded by the FBI. So censorship, we go to surveillance, then I think it's another little um, leap, very small, to the manufacture of facts and, and, the, and the manipulation, as we have uh, beginning to happen in tenderness with the FBI's, the evidence around the FBI and Hoover's great um, interest in getting either Nixon or Lyndon B. Johnson into the White House. Kennedy was going to cause trouble for the FBI. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy were asking questions about FBI activity. Uh, and again, according to biographers, uh, Nixon and Lyndon B. Johnson were thought to um, be more cooperative. 
with with uh, J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. Then they um, they well they turn blind eyes to certain kinds of activity. So mm -hmm. for me, that really resonated with um, things that we see writ large, or that we've had great controversies about around uh, surveillance society. Uh, in the UK, it was Cambridge Analytica. Mm -hmm. um, was in the states as well election manipulation and and at the bottom of it all my i suppose why i really wrote this book is that i, I uh, it sounds quite simplistic but i'll be simplistic i just think democracy is is a miraculous thing it's mm -hmm. a miraculous thing when you look at most of the world and how lucky we are um, in spite of all the difficulties and in spite of all the tensions it's a miraculous mm -hmm. thing it's precious but it's also fragile. And I think what we often don't realize is how it can be chipped away at, from within. And that for me is, is perhaps it was the greatest push for me to write tenderness. Not that I want to sell a message like that. You don't as a novelist, but my own concerns, those, those are the concerns that fueled my long research and, and, and the labor of love that was the writing process. Yeah, absolutely. And I think those come out throughout the book, really. It's really throughout, as you read, they kind of start to develop and you start to ask questions about exactly all of these issues and how, as readers, we get to consider them. We get to uh, take them into our own hands to be angry about, to feel about, to think in response. I think the trial really gets at that, or they're saying, this is going to the ordinary reader. And you have this absolutely amazing scene in the beginning where you, uh, it's in the US trial mm -hmm. and uh, the defense lawyer says, I think, or I think it's someone um, testifying, right? Yeah, uh, I, I think it's actually, I think it's the um, the prosecution lawyer who says, okay. oh, but surely or an ordinary reader would just think this is, this is smutty, an ordinary reader wouldn't see Lady Chatterley's lover in all of these highfalutin terms that you're describing it in. Yeah. To that. And, then, and, and then the response is, I think when anyone reads a book like this, the readers are extraordinary. They are yeah. not ordinary. And yeah. I just love that. You also have a line that says- That's, a real, that's an actual line from the trial. That's an, yeah. I read that, I almost wept. I thought oh. it was one of the beautiful things. And to imagine that, uh, that being said and spoken at the, the general post office in New York in this hearing um, in 1959, I just thought, what a beautiful line. Oh, yeah. And to, to give so much power to a reader, just like any a reader or a voter or a, a citizen has in a democracy, to have a voice and to have a perspective, to be moved by something that we are allowed to have in a free world uh, is a really powerful thing. And the book is such a testament to what can happen when we are allowed to think and allowed or, or not even allowed, but we demand to to have the opportunity to uh, create thought and to think of new ways of living, to to push ourselves forward. Lionel Trilling has a great line in the book that you've written about we can mature, he says, which is very a funny way of describing it. But in a lot of ways, he's right that books and that works really things. Words. And, and, yeah. mm -hmm. and I, I just find I just I think at the bottom of writing tenderness, I I simply so moved when I thought about all of these individual imaginations, obviously in the UK and the States particularly, but more widely than that, because it was published in Europe, it was allowed out in Europe in, in, in a couple of different editions. It just didn't make it into the Anglo-speaking world. We were, we were more worried by it. But when I thought of all the imaginations and all the, in all of those minds and all of those bodies all around the planet, together think we are allowed to imagine we 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 can imagine and then together secretly almost secretly influencing the kind of course of the world the course of the 20th century when this book broke through it wasn't just about one book it it sort of burst something burst open in 1959 1960 and and the century wouldn't be the same again just as it wouldn't be the same again a week later when kennedy was elected we entered into a period of um, uh, some people adore it, some people adore it less perhaps, but for me, I just think I grew up with a sort of almost post, 
I suppose I think of myself as a post-assassination child. I was born the year after the assassination, but I was a, a, a beneficiary of that liberal democracy that had just been ushered in. And it could have so, very, Hoover could have taken control. Hoover mm -hmm. could have had greater control than he already had. He was already covertly monitoring 400,000 US citizens um, for all sorts of um, alleged activity and often um, manufactured, concocted, confabulated activity on behalf of, it's now well documented. But that that side of, 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 of American society, Hoover's side of American society, could have triumphed in the end, but it didn't. It didn't. Um, it's this, this perhaps the strains, you know, the, the tensions are still there. We know they are. Mm -hmm. But there was a period when something else broke through. And um, I was growing up in the States at that time. I, I know I sound quite English now or have a sort of transatlantic accent but I you know I still know my pledge of allegiance to the flag because I and um and my father had Kennedy's speeches on LP and we had Camelot on you know so I was very much brought up in the wake of that mm -hmm. and and I'm just conscious now even with uh, in Germany Angela Merkel stepping down and saying that the one thing she want she wanted to pass on as a wish was that we would all protect democracy because mm -hmm. we're we're in strange times aren't we we're yeah. in strange times with bigger I'm questions always asking is this the end you know are we approaching yeah. fascism are we changing everything about how much power we have over our own lives that's kind of the great question it's, right it's now a great, it's a great debate where we are and we're in the midst of it so it's sort of hard to see over to see to get the lie of the land and the overview but what, certainly for most of us for our the majority of our lives we i felt as if liberal democracy was something that could it was here forever it could never change of course it couldn't but of course now in my later adulthood I mean, middle age i can see it, it it is fragile um and it's also precious and how lucky mm -hmm. we are so mm -hmm. to think that at least in one great wave of that all of that came back to a novel to mm -hmm. and not just the writer, but it, all of the readers co-creating that novel, which is what I'm always conscious that readers do with me, that you have to create on the page enough space for your reader. You can't overtell. You have to, it has to be a, 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 a mutual coming together, a sort of cross-fertilization of writer's mind with reader's mind. And I'm so um, conscious and appreciative when, when, dedicated readers meet me and and together i write it here in my my church and it goes out as a form almost like telepathy mm -hmm. um, of little tiny marks on the page and and meets another mind and to get, i'm i've certainly been changed by books in my lifetime i know they've changed me within and and you know i suppose the the, the hope is that who knows which bits might go into other lives and carry forward it's a kind of magic and um, yeah. yeah oh i love that i love that so much because you're right that the i love hearing about your philosophy sort of of writing a novel and how much you want your reader to as you said create it with you and that the lessons or not even lessons but the messages the uh that what they take from the book is their own and you've given us like such a beautiful landscape to sort of consider and to see and notice among the beauty of what's in front of us, the things that will affect us most deeply are individual to every reader. Yeah. And yet like your book is such a wealth of things to respond to, to feel, to uh, hold in our hands and try to change how we think about things. I feel the same way that books have given me a sort of window to the rest of the world and they really frame everything about how I see it. and. I'm so thrilled when a book like Tenderness can give me a new frame to think and consider about life around me and about history as well. Um, oh, thank you, Morgan. Thank you. Um, you know, I, 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 as well, as, you know, um, you'll know how thrilled I am to have found brilliant editors who've spotted, um, who've spotted uh, p potentials and possibilities. Um, in in early drafts I've sent along, and you were part of that. So yeah. is that is it, again? That's the earliest uh, experience of, of writer to reader, and 
and finding those meetings of minds. But when you think meetings of minds, as Alan Lane did, going back to your um, your uh, little homage to Alan Lane, his publisher of Penguin Books, a book that changed the world. You know, it 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 did. It was before my time. It was certainly before your time. But it did usher in the 1960s and what mm. is sort of crassly dubbed the you know decade of free love and and whatever we think of that, it did it did sort of change society and and it's gone on evolving. I think Lawrence always knew that he was writing for a generation that would come after. And fact, oh, yeah, he, I, I have that great line. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. No, I just have that great line that he yeah. has. Um, if I'll just read a really quick one that he he says, a good story was a form of communication. I have this marked because <laughs> I loved it so much. Mind to mind, spirit to spirit. It sent life sparking from stranger to stranger across space, decades and centuries. Human sympathy, human attention had magic in it, which is your own words as well. Any real story fizzed with sympathy, the writers and readers across time over rows of typographical marks, those low boundary fences of the imagination hurdled. It's just yeah. such a good line about like what he was doing, what you are doing and the powerful work of writers too, to be able to speak to people uh, who are far from them, whether in physical space yeah. or in time. I find it so moving about all of art really, that, that, that art can uh, absolutely collapse the distances between us and also the distances, but also the differences between us. So we're all human under the skin. We are all human under the skin. And I think if if having a reading life since I was little has taught me anything, it's no matter how outwardly different we might seem and however we measure that difference, that under the skin we share, we, we're all afraid, we all fall in love, uh, you know, we all love the smell of a rose, we're afraid of the dark when we're children, all of those things connect us, and 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 I, I, above all, I just think the uh, uh, acts of the imagination create bridges between um, distant distant galaxies, really distant galaxies of experience that we're here on this one planet. Yeah. And I think you meant. Um, I remember we were having a discussion earlier about. Um, the way I use uh, or try to use D.H. Lawrence's words within and incorporate mm -hmm. in to the actual to my text, and we're talking about you know, we're sort of why do that and is it fun or is it difficult, and in in sort of almost showing how Lady Chatterley and the, and also one particular short story that connects, it's showing almost the brushstrokes of how those I want to try to. Um, to pay homage to the reader as well to say these are the bits that you can now watch you're almost witnessing live the the the, the wet ink of creation um you know i almost wanted that ink to feel wet uh, as it's being and also to have some 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 secret insights mm -hmm. into what lies between the lines of Lawrence's words that like, normally i would read it you would read it and you haven't, you know, there hasn't been some um, um, dogged researcher like me in a basement archive working through things or going out and visiting different locations. But I felt um, I could show the reader by actually bringing in the text, but then creating the living scenes around it that would show, for example, in one short story, we're getting the short story, we're reading about certain individuals, but we're also seeing that particular family and mm -hmm. how Lawrence betrayed them really very badly, um, um, very in a way that wounded them for generations. Uh, and and, and, and so, um, rightly so. I mean, it's one of those, uh, those conundrums of the writing experience of, uh, uh, where one uses life. And what extent is that an honoring of life? And to what extent is it a betrayal of real lives? And in that case, he wrote a, a powerful short story, but at the expense of a family who were misrepresented and betrayed. So many people might read in my late England, but I, but I really wanted to be able to offer a sort of insider knowledge of what was what lies between those lines. And also with Lady Chatterley, 
people often assume it's a natural assumption and it's not untrue that that Lady Chatterley is modeled off Lawrence's wife, Frida Lawrence, who is a, a sort of minor aristocrat and, uh, from an aristocratic family in Germany. And that, in a way, sat very comfortably, I would argue, as a kind of cover story for the Lawrences. It was much more convenient than, the, than another truth, which was the truth that he'd had a love affair with a woman called Rosalind, Rosalind Baines, a, a woman on the brink of divorce. Uh, and it was a three week affair. It was his only love affair of marriage, his only extramarital affair. Frida, by mutual consent, was having many. Mm. But Lawrence, he, Lawrence wasn't um, made that way. But he, he had been powerfully attracted to Rosalind Baines. And when you know her biography and who she was, uh, you can see her life story running through that of Lady Chatterley. So, and to try to get those pen strokes down, I felt I could take readers into certain secrets of creation in doing that. And for me, that was a great pleasure being able to do that. Yeah, the book becomes very meta in a lot of ways because we're seeing you as a reader and writer try to dig into Lawrence's words into, um, for those who haven't read it yet, there's lines from his poetry, from those short stories, and of course, from Lady Chatterley's Lover when we uh, meet Rosalind. And, you as a writer do such a beautiful job of bringing her to life. And then Lawrence's words come in as an echo. And it's it's a really beautiful sort of, as you call it, a dialogue between his work and what you're trying to understand about the people he was writing on and what would they have been like if, as we have in front of us on the page. And that's such a special thing for you as a reader to then share with us as a writer to bring it to life based on what we have as the text, but what he's given us to sort of experience and wonder about and these people that become, uh, that are given life in his books and in yours. It's a really exciting kind of exchange. Yeah, I just couldn't resist sharing, letting, uh, and partly it all ultimately feeds into, it's a kind of or orchestral buildup, but all eventually sort of surges towards the 1960 trial at the end of the novel. Um, but there are so many, into that surge, so many little rivers and tributaries that actually in reality did flow and contribute to the great wave that would sort of crash in 1960 with that trial. Mm -hmm. And they, be, they begin in sort of little quiet ways. Um, but I wanted to, to, as you say, I wanted to be able to offer the reader that sort of secret knowledge of, of what lay behind um, the, the book that we simply think of as an, a, a taboo novel from 1928. There's so much more behind it, even behind the very famous trial in 1960. I myself, having long known about that trial, had assumed, you know, yeah, you know, of course it was 1960, of course the book was going to win, of course Penguin was going to win, but there was no of course about it. I, no, and I, they almost lost, it was devastating. They, they, they almost, there's this moment where they're like, oh, that might yeah. be the end. And, and that's been more or less, I've, I've spoken to Lawrence scholars who, and I'm not bad as, a, as on my, in my academic life as on, on my DH Lawrence, but I've spoken to Lawrence scholars who really had very little sense of it. And so I spent months in the archives for both the prosecution of the trial and the defense and uncovering actually what went on behind the scenes of that trial and just what a mighty risk Alan Lane took, how, how courageous he was, mm -hmm. because not only could he or his company face an unlimited fine, that was one thing, but what's sort of been lost to literary history is that no, no one would rule out the possibility that he could be in prison for three years. It was just never ruled out. So uh, that when the verdict came, he was potentially facing uh, in the Old Bailey here uh, in London, being taken downstairs into the cells. Um, so it, it was much yeah. more going on, and it was mu it was a it was an, it was a knife edge. Yeah, and that drama of, of Alan Lane potentially going to prison is there in the book. But what I love too is that you have so many people testifying for why this book should exist and why it really should should be in the world for readers to experience that you know the the drama of the trial is inherently that this book might not be 
allowed to be read because of you know these sort of ludicrous concerns about the, the danger of people being able to think about this and what would happen if if people are reading about sex in this way and love in this way and uh we have so the book is just a delight in the way that so many characters are able to sort of espouse their love of it and of everything that D.H. Lawrence was able to do with it, that you really become like rooting for this as a work of art uh, yeah. in the trial. It's very, it's oh. very, it's a good, it really becomes a very fast paced read uh, when we get to the trial part, which is- a I, I certainly was, even though I knew I'd been through all the research, but um, I, you know, I was, I just, I was gripped and I, you know, of course I take something about, I think it's about, I don't know, 800, 900 pages of transcript and, and distill it right down um and then weave try to weave in a sense of the characters whom the reader might or might not know taking you know taking the stand um well, i think the one character i was most moved by was the character of em forster coming mm -hmm. back as an as an elderly man quite frail and uh back in 1915 em forster had and Lawrence had come to know each other a little bit. Forster had paid Lawrence a visit. And in brief, uh, for, uh, Lawrence had really been very cruel to E.M. Forster um, because E.M. Forster was, uh, was, an, um, uh, was, was a homosexual writer, but unacknowledged at the time. So um, un unable to say who he, act who he truly was. And he had by that time already written his illicit novel, called Morris, or in North America we'd say Maurice, um, uh, and, but that would not be published until after his death. He had expressed wishes that we published posthumously, a love affair between an aristocrat and, and his servant. Um, and that had already been written, but it was lay, lay secret. And so Worcester really carried some very heavy secrets close to his heart, and he seemed such a lovely and gentle man. And yeah. Lawrence had a temper. Lawrence had perhaps a kind of mood disorder, I think we might say today. Mm -hmm. Certainly he had anger management problems. And he really tore into uh, to Forster one, one night, February 1915, and was very cruel. And nevertheless, um, Forster emerges 45 years later, having been very wounded by Lawrence, but will not see his book, Lawrence's book, not, he will not, not have that book defended. He will not not speak up for that book. Mm -hmm. So loyal and true, partly oh, to learn so from the literature. And I found that even that little story, I find incredibly moving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, it's a worth a book worth defending, a book worth reading, and uh, a book worth celebrating. Which your book does all of those things and is in its own right worth the ex the experience of uh, reading and being able to. Um, think about all of these things we've talked about today um, and then just enjoy as readers the pleasure of, of getting to know these characters, of thinking about their inner lives and then in turn thinking about our own. And I think this book really gives us a lot to feel and, uh, and I really enjoyed it and I hope everyone uh, listening will enjoy and read as well. Um, I think we might be out of time, but um, I don't know if Saviana, you're here. If there's any questions, Hello. Hello. Yes, no questions at the moment, but just wanted to say again, thank you everyone who came and listened despite the difficulties that we had in the beginning and thank you both so much for being understanding and for this wonderful conversation it's just been so great to listen to and thank you so much my pleasure thank you very much Saviana and Morgan huge thanks for thank you Allison this is a pleasure it's really wonderful to hear about your process and about uh, everything that tenderness means to you and and how you wrote it it's really an achievement and I'm really excited that I got to talk to you about it today. thank you likewise thank you thank you all all right I hope everyone has a great rest of their day and thank you again for joining <laughs>